Uh, great to be here with everyone today, and uh, hello to everyone out there watching. And my message today uh, is not necessarily two parts. I'm gonna, today I'm going to talk about, it's going to be a complete sermon, but the uh, PEP is going to relate to it. So there's people who are probably driving up for PEP, so, so if you listen to this, this may help you uh, answer some of the questions we'll have <laughs> uh, later today, because I'll ask the questions. If you're paying attention, you'll know them, and maybe, maybe. but that's going to be as far, as far as PEP. I need to clean my garage. I need to clean my garage. I, I've realized this for a while now. I guess ever since I moved, I have... Uh, I brought, you know, you, you, when you move, you pack up all the stuff in boxes and you bring it into your garage and I got it all in there. And so I only took out what I needed. And I realized there was, I didn't need as much as what I had <laughs> that was in there. So there's a lot of boxes. But then there would be like times I would be like, where is such and such? I need a, I need like a, like a, like a screwdriver or something. So I'm like, all right, I'm gonna go find it. So I'll go in there and start looking through stuff. And all right, all right, I get my screwdriver and I come out. So, so over, t- over time, it became kind of a mess in the garage. You know, I got the boxes there. I got some things. I, you know, so I'd get, get a box come in from Amazon and, well, I might need this box later and throw it in there. So, so again, I need to clean my garage. Now, you know, people who've been in my house, the rest of my house is organized and, and neat. I, I like neat, but my garage needs some work. Uh, so I was thinking, well, there's different ways I could go about the cleanup. I could power through it, right? So if you ever had to clean a garage or do something, you can go like, all right, I'm going to start, and I'm not going to stop until I finish, and this garage will be clean. So that, that's the way to do it. It may take, you know, six to eight hours. I don't know how long it's going to take. Uh, it may take less. Or I could probably uh, do a little bit each day. Or I could, do, I could do, like, you know, 30 minutes here, you know, or 30 minutes a day for a week or two weeks. So I could divide it up into smaller sections, and so it might be easier to, to accomplish it that way. I could start with, like, the biggest part of the project, right? I'd say, well, what's the biggest mess that I have in the garage? What I need to get rid of first? And do that first, and then when that's done, then the rest of it doesn't seem so bad. You're like, oh, well, you know, now this is easier. So that's how we, you know, we have things, we, we go about those things. Uh, you know, we, we want to make sure everything goes where it lives. I remember uh, someone once had a sermon, and they talked about put the hammer where the hammer lives. Uh, and they were, they were actually talking about straightening up your garage or something. I was like, yeah, put the hammer where the hammer lives. And, and I don't know where my hammer lives in my garage actually right now, so we'll have to figure that out. But by the time, the time it's through, we will probably have a place for the, for the hammer. Again, many, many ways to go, go about this, uh, to clean and organize the garage. But the best way for me to do it that I found to, to accomplish anything is to set a goal. If I set a goal, so I can say, is my goal... Uh, that my garage will be organized by December 14th. So that gives me a couple of weeks. I can put it up there. Garage organized December 14th. And then I can, you know, make steps to accomplish that goal. I've read a lot of books about goal setting uh, when I was working uh, at restaurants, Arby's, Wendy's, especially Arby's. I, I worked at a franchise, and the name of the franchise was Results Through Motivation. And so they were always about motivating people to, uh, to get results. And, and it actually worked. They were really good. You know, they always, it was like a very fun place to work because it was always about results. And they made me read, you know, say, here, read this book about goals. Read this book. Read these books. So I read a lot of these books, you know, like How to Win Friends and Influence People. You know, many of you all probably have read, uh, read that book. Uh, Seven Habits of Highly Successful People. We're probably those familiar with those books. Think and Grow Rich. Uh, the Power of Positive Thinking. Uh, Seven Laws of Success. I think a lot of y'all probably read that. Seven Laws of Success is a, a book in, in, in similar fashion. Uh, we actually have a book uh, by Winston Co. It's on the uh, Philippines uh, Church of God International website. And it's called Christians at Work, Biblical Secrets to Achieving Success in the Workplace. And so this is on the Philippine side. It's kind of aimed at the Philippine culture a little bit. But you can go, but, but most of it's, you know, just, just as good for us. So he has uh, a book that's it's available there, a digital form. You can go read it right there on the website. Uh, so there's a lot of books out there that give advice about how, how, to, how to set goals, how to accomplish goals, how to be successful. Problem is, is that very few people who, who read these, th- these books actually do it. Right? So that's the problem. <laughs> we have all this advice out there, things that we need to do. And very few people actually uh, do those, those things. So I need to clean my garage. I need to make it a goal. So today I'm, we're going to look at 
biblical principles of goal setting. So biblical principles of goal setting. Uh, in almost all of the self-help books, most of the advice in there is biblical advice. When I, when I, when I, read, I would always notice, like when I would read these books, I would say, you know, this, I've read about something like that in the Bible, about getting things done, so was, or in Proverbs. There's always something, whenever you're reading a self-help book, that a lot of their advice really goes back to the Bible, because the Bible is the ultimate self-help book in, in, in how to, to have a better life. So when we talk about uh, achieving goals, we're going to talk about biblical goals. And I don't want to confuse this with New Year's resolutions, right? Because New Year's resolutions are, are, are something else. Uh, New Year's resolutions, I, I believe, are kind of worthless, at least in my experience. Because uh, most people, they'll, they'll have a resolution, and within a couple of weeks, <laughs> they then forgot it. So this is the time of year uh, where people, you know, they'll join gyms, right? At the beginning of the year, a lot of gyms will be full. Uh, they'll make, you know, different goals. Oh, yes, I'll do this differently this year. And this actually goes back, and as many, many in our church will let us know, uh, that <clears throat> this has a pagan origin, right? New Year's resolutions, that the Babylonians, way back, would make a promise at the beginning of the year to their gods. Uh, the Romans would make a promise to Janus, I guess Janus for January, and they, you know, they would say, well, we'll make our promises to the god Janus. So, so these New Year's resolutions go back to these promises people would make to gods, and I guess, you know, they would, you know, I don't know if they, they're probably the same way back then. They probably made them and they forgot about them <laughs> as well. But biblical-based goals are different. Uh, and so, so when we look at these goals, we're, we're going to look at them and we'll look at different uh, principles. And the first principle is kind of basic. Uh, the first principle of a biblically-based goal is that it's biblically-based. So <laughs> I guess that's obvious. That sounds obvious, right? Uh, but I can reword that maybe to make it sound a little smarter. Uh, <laughs> So, so our goals will be most successful if they're in agreement with God's will as revealed in Scripture. So that's, that's the most important thing about biblically-based goals, is that our goals will be most successful or will be able to accomplish the goals if they are in agreement with God's will in Scripture. So I can, we can look at Matthew 6.33. Matthew 6.33. Matthew 6.33 says, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. So, so that's, that's a, and we're going to put this in the context here, but that's kind of the, the starting point of goals, is that the first thing in our lives should be about seeking God's kingdom and everything should be around it. So when setting goals, our number one goal is, is the kingdom of God. And then everything that we have as goals should relate to that in some way. If they don't, I mean, I guess it's okay, but the, the most important goals will relate to that. Uh, so let's put it in the context. So Matthew 6, verse 25. It says, Therefore, I say to you, don't worry about your life, what you'll eat or what you'll drink, nor about your body, what you'll put on. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather in the barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. And you are more valued than they. Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to its stature? So, you know, he's saying, don't worry, you know, about food and drink, because he says the most important thing is, is the kingdom of God. It says, so why are you worrying about clothing? Verse 8, consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you, even Solomon in all his glory was arrayed like one of these. So, now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is today is, and tomorrow is grown to the oven, we are not much more clothe you of, of, of little faith. So don't worry, what, saying what we shall eat or drink. He says, verse 32, for after all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. And then, so in context, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things shall be added to you. So in biblical goal setting, the first thing is that they have to be based on the Bible with God first. And these other things that we kind of need, right, because we need clothing, uh, we, need, you know, we, need, we need food. There's things that we need in our lives, and if we, if we, we plan our lives and execute our lives successfully, 
we have to do it <laughs> by goals. All right, so our goals will be most successful if they're in agreement with God's will as revealed in Scripture. So, so I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example of a personal goal. I'm going to share all my goals. I'm going to show you some personal goals. So I have a personal goal uh, to lose 20 more pounds. I, I, I can share this goal with you because I think most, and I, I did research, that 75% of the men in the United States are overweight and 60% of women. So everybody can relate to me on this, or at least most of the people. So, all right, I understand you. You, know, you have a goal to lose 20 pounds. So does my goal fit into that first goal, <laughs> seeking first the kingdom of God? Or, or is, is it something that could be, be in there? So in other words, is it God's will that I lose 20 pounds? So, and, and so and when we talk about God's will, a lot of times, you know, it's not done by, like, reading tea leaves or, you know, just, you know, just saying, thinking, oh, I think this may be God's will for me. To understand, you know, or making assumptions about God's will, to understand what God's will is for us is what he actually has in his word. So I'm going to take my goal. My goal is I want to lose 20 pounds. Does that goal fit into Scripture? So I, I, can, I can think of a couple of Scriptures that it does fit into. One is in uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 19. And 1 Corinthians 6, 19, it says, Or do, not, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? So, so from that, I say, well, okay. We're, 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 we're the temple of God's Holy Spirit, our body, you know, God's in us. And I know it's, there's a lot of spiritual aspects to that, keeping ourselves clean spiritually. But we can say, oh, yeah, if, 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 if this is our, God's body, it belongs to Christ, then it's his will that I be as healthy as I can be and that I, make, and I can have a goal to be healthy. Uh, Jeremiah 33, 6, Jeremiah 33, 6 says, Behold, you know, God, God speaking, he says, Behold, I, I, I bring it health and healing. I will heal them. And reveal to them the abundance of peace and truth. So God, again, I can say, what's well, God's will for his people to be healthy and to be healed and to have these things? So, so I would say, yes, my, my goal that, 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 that I have of, 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 of losing the 20 pounds, all right, that goal is a biblically-based goal. Well, what about cleaning my garage? <laughs> what about cleaning my garage? Is it God's will... That my garage be clean, or, to, or will that fit into God's will? Well, I, well, that's like that's a little bit harder for me to thought, you know. I'm trying to look. So, where can I think about this? I say, all right, First uh, Corinthians fourteen thirty three. First uh, Corinthians fourteen thirty three says, "Well, for God is not the offer of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints." Now, I know in context, he's talking about in the church we don't have confusion. But I say, well, if God's not the offer of confusion in the church. You know, should I have confusion in my in my in my, in my garage. And I think, well, also, you know, there's scriptures about how, you know, God's creator and God does things in order. There's all kinds of scriptures I can look at that God is a God of order, that God does things in plans. And I look at my garage and I say, is it God's will for me to go in there and straighten that garage? And I can say, yeah, I can, I can fit that into God's will. <laughs> that, that it would be a good thing to do that. So the first principle of our goal setting, the, the, our goals must, will be successful if they are in agreement with God's will, as revealed in Scripture. The, the next principle, the next principle, Matthew, is, is, here in Matthew 6, it says, seek, seek ye first the kingdom of God. Matthew 6, 33, we're back to, to where we started. Matthew 6, 33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. But we're going to look at verse 34. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. He says, sufficient for to today is his own trouble. So, you know, we don't worry about tomorrow, per se. Worry about today, or do things today. And so, so I think that the, I, from this I can say, all right, so if I'm looking at setting goals biblically, God says, well, do things today. We, we, should, we should address it daily. So, so, so I have a goal, I want to lose 20 pounds. Well, I can say, well, today I eat a burger, today I eat this and this, tomorrow, tomorrow we start, right? So that's, 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 that's what we call procrastination. And I, I've, always, I've always, I always made a joke that I was going to get around to giving a sermon about procrastination. All right, this is it. This is the sermon about procrastination. This is it right here, all right? So if we're setting goals, we can't procrastinate. You know, if we have goals, that we, if they're biblical goals, 
There's things we can do daily, even if it's a Sabbath day. I said, well, I can rest today so that I can have energy tomorrow <laughs> to accomplish my goals. So there's things that we can do daily uh, to do that. And so what are things that also we can do daily that are really our major goals, right, that we should do daily? And these are things we know like prayer, right? We should have, we should have daily goals for prayer, uh, Bible study, uh, prayers for meditation, thinking, you know, what we think should be something daily that we, uh, that we have goals to do. Uh, Philippians uh, chapter 4, verse 8 and 9 tells us about this, this, this daily thing that we should do. In Philippians 4, verse 8 and 9, it says, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, and again, this goes in kind of opposite of like, you know, when people are worrying, right? So if you're worrying, you're not thinking about these things. You're, you're worried about all kinds of crazy things, right? But to have biblical goals... You've got to meditate on what's good. Meditate on, on, on the goals, what God, has, you know, what God has planned for you, and you want to know what God has planned for you. It's in his word. Think about these things. He says, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. So, so one thing about goals, and this I, I, I learned this from someone when I was working for Results Through Motivation, <laughs> is that if you have goals, like take your goals, write down your goals, and maybe if you can't think of them every day, put them on your mirror. So when you wake up in the morning, you know, I'll see a goal that says, says lose 20 pounds, or so a goal, clean the garage. And, I, and, if I, and if that's a goal I have in my life, I keep seeing that. I'm like, I've got to go, you know, I've got I to do something daily. So again, the second thing, don't procrastinate. <laughs> Get it done today. Get it done today. So again, first, our goals will, are most successful if, if they're in agreement with God's will. As we are seeking the kingdom of God, our goals need to be done daily. And the third, the third one, and the third principle, biblical principle, is stop being lazy. Stop being lazy. That's the reason why people can't accomplish goals. And, and I say this, you know, because I can say it to myself, right? It's like the reason why you don't get things accomplished is because of laziness. And, there, and, and the Bible has a lot to say about this. And this is, this is really, you know, when I look at all these self-help books, and I look, people go to these, you have these motivational speakers, they'll get up there and they'll, they'll talk about kind of this stuff right here, and say, you need to do this and this, and this is how you earn wealth. And you'll have a small percentage of people who go to that class who actually do it, and the rest, oh, that's a great idea, and they never do anything. Stop being lazy. A lot of the, the health and wealth preachers, and they have them out there, and they'll tell you the secret to success, right, if you want to win... Uh, and the, they'll usually say faith, you know, you've got to have faith, uh, and tithing. They'll talk about tithing. And, and they actually treat tithing like a lottery ticket. That's, uh, you know, I, I've heard it's like, you know, the, the, the ones that, you know, you have, you know, they have faith, belief. And for me, faith involves a lot of work. <laughs> and that's another subject. But for them, faith is just, you know, just believe. And then tithing, that, you know, give your seed, plant your seed. And then God will, will, will reward your seed. And I, I want to look at that. We're going to look at some scriptures that people use. And we're going to see, well, what, what, how does tithing actually work? All right, Malachi uh, chapter 3. This, this is one we go to uh, on holy days. It's a good one to go. Like, it's a good one to go if you're talking about tithing. Uh, it says, will a man rob God? This is verse 8. Yet you have robbed me, but you say, and why have we robbed you? And tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse. For you have robbed me, even this whole nation. He says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. And here's, what, here's where, you know, the, the health and wealth and the people who are, who are like, all right, you know, you've know, you got to use your seed money. You've got you to plant your seed. You've got to use this money. He says, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. And again, that's a great blessing, and that's a true. That's absolutely true. If you tithe, according to how God describes tithing, you can receive those blessings. But the, but the thing is, 
is that tithing does not work if you're lazy. All right, <laughs> tithing doesn't work. Tithing does not go in hand in hand with laziness. All right, and I've always heard, uh, and probably people have said this in the church, I don't know if I've heard it here per se, but I heard it when I was a kid. In the, I went to a Pentecostal church, and they always say that the first 10% that you have, that belongs to God, and the 90% belongs to you. And, and I always believe that. I believe that, right? You know, when, when you, you, you know, first 10% belongs to God, 90% belongs to you. God's wonderful to let us keep 90%, and we give 10% to him. And I agree with this. Uh, Deuteronomy 6, 5, just, just one verse, it says, tells us that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your might. So, so again, that's, that's a good principle. We should put God first in all things. But when we look at the tithing command, so we're going to look at where actually God talks about tithing, when we first see tithing in God's word, what does it actually say? And then how can these, these, uh, these examples of tithing be used for us when we set goals to be successful? Because, again, another goal that people have, right, people, people want to be successful monetarily, whether it is, you know, they want extra money, uh, you know, m- most people in our country can't even come up with $500, you know, in an emergency, right? And it's like, and that, that's, that's a statistic that's, that's widely available. And the thing is, if you, if you understand what God says, you know, you can be successful but with this principle. All right. So Genesis 14. Genesis 14 is uh, the first example we have here. Genesis chapter 14 and verse 7. It says, after his, this is Abraham, Abram, it says, after his return from the feet of Tralomar and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shava, that is the king's valley, and Melchizedek. It says, king of Salem brought out bread and wine, and says, he was a priest of the Most High God. So Melchizedek, before we had a Levitical priesthood, this man was a priest, of the Most High God, he taught, you know, generally the same things that we, we teach. Uh, but before, before it was in, in, in you know, in, in Leviticus or Exodus, they, they, were, they were being taught uh, under this priesthood. In verse 19, he says, And he blessed him, and he said, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave him a tenth of everything. So of what he was able to, you know, accomplish in this battle, he gave one-tenth. So I say, yeah, all right, so a tenth belongs to God of everything. Uh, and some people, and I've, and I've seen, again, so there's, there's people, if you go on the web and, and people have these arguments about tithing, and they'll try to falsely argue, I've seen arguments that tithing only applies to produce or livestock about tithing, or, or you know, or articles that say, well, Tithing only, you know, that's for the Levitical priesthood. So since we're not under the Levitical priesthood, there's no obligation to tithe. But uh, again, and they, but they, what they, when they make these arguments, go ahead, yeah, make these arguments. But you're failing to see the connection between tithing and wealth, because there's a connection between tithing and wealth. And this is before, right? This is before the Levitical priesthood. Abram was tithing. So again, I would say. Good evidence that tithing is still, if Christ is after the order of Melchizedek in Hebrews, it's still the exact same way. And you have to understand why it's important. Why it's important. All right, so new covenant is after the order of Melchizedek. So, so let's look at the actual the law, the law in Leviticus. Leviticus 27, just a few verses in Leviticus 27. So that's the first example we have in Scripture. Then we have the, the law that God gives when it's codified to Israel in Leviticus Chapter 27 and verse 30. He says, Every tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or the fruit of the trees, is the Lord's, is holy to the Lord. If a man wishes to redeem some of his tithe, he shall add a fifth to it. And every tithe of herds and flocks, every tenth animal of all that pass under the herdsman's staff shall be holy to the Lord. So, so he says, Every tenth animal. So this is, this is you know, it applies to, I guess, their produce. It applies to their animals. And he says every tenth animal. So, again, it's a little different than what I've heard with my life. It's not the first animal, right? It's like you've got to have ten animals, 
And then God takes the tenth animal. And so if you have ten sheep, does the first sheep or the tenth sheep belong to God? According to this, it's the tenth sheep. So, so, so he's saying you need at least ten sheep to tithe. So it's expected from God that you're going to have ten sheep, right? If, you, if you're going to tithe, you've got to have ten sheep. Because you can't get one-tenth of nine sheep, I guess, unless you kill them all. And then you can maybe, maybe do it that way, I guess, or you slaughter them. So when it comes to tithing, God expects us to work. To work. To not be lazy. So you can't approach it like a magic, like a magic lottery ticket. Because so, I need to leave. So if I'm going to tithe, I've got to raise ten sheep. I've got to raise enough to cover... All my expenses, and have enough to give to God. And that takes work for me to do that thing. And if I do that, God says he's going to bless me. But how does he bless me? I received a prayer rug in an envelope that came to my house. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't ask this. I actually, one time I sent away just for different uh, religious things to see what people would do as far as you know, fundraising and what they would send me. And they sent me some crazy stuff. And so this one, this one person, they sent me like a prayer rug and said, they said, well, here's your prayer rug. Take this prayer rug, say your prayer, and put it underneath your bed at night. And, all right, put it underneath your, underneath your bed. And then when you're through, take the prayer rug, fold it up, put it in this envelope, and include your tithe in the envelope, and God will bless you 100-fold. And, and, and I thought about that. I was like, all right. What, 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 are they, what are they saying? So, 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 so I, take, I do my little prayer thing or whatever they're talking about, and I put it in there. How's that supposed to work? Is it, am I going to like put $10 in there, and then I'm going to get a hundredfold? Just by, you know, what, what's going to happen? Is, I'm, is someone going to knock on my door and say, hey, Jeff, here's, you know, here's $100, or here's, there's, there's $1,000. Is there a check going to arrive in my mail? Hey, who here receives checks out of the blue in their, in their, in their, in their mailbox? I don't. <laughs> right? Those things don't happen. So how is God going to reward you if you tithe, if you just think of it as, as some kind of you know, lottery ticket? All right, so, so God will only increase the work of your hands if you work. Now, if you work, if you, and again, you, and this is talk, tithing, when it originally applied, it's talking about crops and animals. And if you want to have a, you know, so it says, God says, I will bless your crops, right, if you, if you tithe. Well, he's not going to, that's not only going to work if you go out there and plant the crops, if you go out there and take care of the crops, if you harvest the crops, if you do the work involved to produce that and the tithe. So tithing only works in, if you're not lazy. If you, if you do it, it will work. God will bless the work of your hands. So you don't look at it that way. So again, it's, it's this part of this, this, this third principle of goal setting. Proverbs 6. Proverbs 6 talks about this as well. Proverbs 6 and verse 4. I'm sorry, verse, I'm sorry, verse 6. I'm sorry. Verse 6. It says, go to the ant. So we always, we've talked about the ant before, and we know this thing about the ant. It says, go to the ant, O sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise. Without having any chief officer or ruler... She re- prepares her bread in summer and gathers her food in harvest. Now, I've had a battle with ants in my yard. I don't know, have y'all ever had a battle with ants? I've had this, actually, this last year I've had a battle with some ants. I bought, it's a little, little round thing, and it's got like little stuff on top, and you go to the ant, ant bed, and you shake it on there, and it's supposed to kill all the ants. So I would do that before I would cut my grass. I'd go out there, and I'd look around. And I'd say, all right, there's, there's an ant bed, and I'd shake some on there. And then I'd find some more, and I'd shake some. And so I got it all covered. And so the next day, I'd come cut my grass. And sure enough, I'm, I'm cutting my grass, I'm walking through, and what's biting me, right? They, those ants, they would have made another mound. <laughs> like the next day. Like whatever, they, they, got, they got the word that I was out there, you know, uh, telling the attack. With the, they got another mound, and I'm walking through ants, and they're biting me. So ants... In the battle of the ants in my yard, they keep winning. <laughs> they, they keep winning because ants 
they don't give up. They work harder than probably any animal we know of in, in, building, in building their mounds and, having, and, and doing the things they do. Ants, uh, you ever have ants that come inside your house? I don't have any that have it now, but I used to live a place where I would live. If I put a piece of candy out, like you know, an hour later, there'd be a trail of ants coming through the candy and going out the door. Because you know, the ants, they send out what, like scout ants. You know, if they were getting to your house, you're in trouble, right? The scan out, scan, he's looking for like a piece of candy or whatever, something sweet. And he finds it, and as soon as he gets it, he like, he puts some scent down, he walks all the way back to the mound, tells his friends, and they just, there's a long line. And they're nonstop. You, you smash them, smash them, they keep coming. Smash them, you have to spray or whatever. And, and to stop, ants do not give up. They are not lazy. He says to you, and, and, and here he says, go to the ant, O sluggard. And that example of ants is, is a good example. Verse 9. So how long will you lie there, O sluggard, when you arise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you like a robber and won't like an armed man. So, so the point of the proverb is easy. Don't be lazy. <laughs> Don't be lazy. Now look at the parables of Jesus, right? We, we don't, I mean, the parable of the sower, parable of the talents, uh, the, the parable of the ten virgins, the sheep and the goats, all these parables that Christ, and, and, and the only thing I get from this is that Christ wants us to not be lazy. He wants us to work and to do things. All right, so, so, so when we have goals, our goal has to be biblically based. God's will in Scripture, it has to be done daily, right? We can't procrastinate. And we just got to stop being lazy in achieving these goals. All right, principle number four. Principle number four. We can find that. Let's go to Colossians chapter three. Colossians chapter three. Colossians three, verse 22. We're told it says, slaves, obey your earthly masters and everything. And then we think of slaves, and we think, well, slave, that was, there's no more slaves. That was way back when they had slaves. We actually, there's more people alive who are in slavery now than ever before in human history. I think uh, the number is like 46 million people are in forced labor around the world. That's awful. And, if, and again, and sometimes people are born into this, they're put into this. And imagine be, being in forced labor where you get up, you got to work, and you gotta, you know, maybe you'll get some sleep, maybe you'll get to eat or have some time, but you're working for whoever. So he says, slave, obey your masters and everything. Not only with their eyes on you and the curry of their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for your Lord. Now also, you know, so we don't have that, but we do have employers, right? People we work for are em- employers. That's probably what we can relate to. And it says... Not only the curry their you know, eyes on you, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. So, like, if you're working and, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're goofing off or you're on the phone or doing something, your boss comes in and you're like, oh, I'm back to work or something, right? So people, 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 people tend to do those type of things. He says, that's not, that's not how you work. Verse 23, he says, whatever you do, work at it, and he just, even if you're a slave, you know, working against your will, he says, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord and not for human masters. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as reward. It is the Lord Christ who you are serving. And anyone who does wrong will be repaid to the wrongs and there's no favoritism. So, so, so what we do at work or things we do, he says, do it as for the Lord. And so, so I can think of that like now, because my job is I work here at the church. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, of course. But most of my life I've worked for restaurants or I worked in retail. And I had to, you know, have goals. And the thing to realize is that when you're working, wherever you're doing, wherever you're working, whatever you're doing, is that the principle of that should be, that you're doing it for the Lord. And that should be, obviously, a goal in your life. 
That like, like when I was working as a restaurant, so what's my goal? Well, I want to give people the best food possible. I want to do it for them quickly. I want to be friendly to these people. I want to do it because it's the right thing to do. The right thing to do, and I'm doing it because I'm doing it because that's what God wants me to do. God wants me to be really good service for these people. And I'm pleasing the Lord when I do my job in an excellent way. And that's what he's saying here. So, so when you, whatever, you, whatever you do, and if you don't have the attitude... That, if, you, if you find that attitude, and I found that attitude when I was working in a restaurant and also when I worked at Walmart, I said, I'm, this is attitude, I mean, this is the attitude I have. Do it for the Lord, and that whole day, everything you do will be rewarding, and, and will be working towards that kingdom of God, right? So that goal can be now part of being a part of the kingdom of God because you're doing something for the Lord. So, so... Setting our, our work goals can align with God's, can more align with God's word. And we can grow and develop by those goals. So we want to work for Christ no matter what we do. So Philippians uh, chapter 3 verse 12 says, Not that I've already attained... Or I'm already perfected by a press on that I may, hold, may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I, I do, forgetting those things which are behind me and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, right? I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So whatever, you know, whatever it is, principle number four of biblical goal setting is that whatever you do, whatever it is, and if you choose a goal, even if my goal is to go clean my garage, whatever it is you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. Do it with all your heart. All right, so the first one, our goal has got to align with Scripture. Do something every day. Don't be lazy. Do it with all your heart. And the, the, final, the final principle, I go up to Philippians chapter 4. We'll find that there. Philippians 4 verse 10. It says, I, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at last you care, your care for me has flourished again, though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I've learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased. I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. So Paul, he understands the goods and the bad. And again, that, and your life will, will have ups and downs. But verse 13, he says, I can do all things. Through Christ who strengthens me. So the fifth principle of goals, goal setting, goal achieving, is that we must achieve the goals with the guidance of Christ through his Holy Spirit. His Holy Spirit has to be in us, and we have to, you know, that Christ can be a part of our success in achieving our goals. We can do all things through Christ. Romans chapter 8. Verse 26. Or verse 28. Romans uh, chapter 8 verse 28 tells us, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Who have been called according to his purpose. So the fifth thing we, that, that we have to rely on is that, that Christ gives us the power and the ability to accomplish our goals. I think that's why a lot of people don't accomplish anything. Because they leave, they leave, they leave Christ out of it. And they, they, they think, well, maybe I, I, I've always failed. I've always been, never been able to get anything accomplished. And so I'll never, I never will be able to. And, and when we talk about goals, like say, say for instance I set a goal, like my goal is... Uh, to lose 20 pounds. Well, like, 
you know, what if I only lose 10? Did I fail? No, I lost 10 pounds. So, so you, again, if you have goals and say maybe you don't complete them, but you get further along, you're constantly winning, and things can keep, keep improving. And you just set more goals. You just, you just say, okay, got that done. We move ahead in our goals. So, so I'm going to look at the two goals I shared, and we're going we're to look at them how, if they agree, again, with the five points. So clean my garage. I would say, yeah, agrees with Scripture. I'm kind of stretching it, but agrees with Scripture. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, do things daily. Yeah, I, yeah, daily. Or I could do it early. Not, don't procrastinate, right? I probably should start it tonight. All right, so after the sun goes down, if I want to get this accomplished, I'd like, well, I better, I better get in there tonight and, and go, go access things and start working on it. If that's my goal to get this accomplished, why wait till tomorrow? So that's the second thing. Uh, stop being lazy. Stop being lazy. All right, yeah, I, that will that will work in this case. Stop being lazy. Get it done. Uh, do it with all your heart. Be as clean as it can possibly be. You know, even even if it's I'm just doing it doing it for Christ. And use the strength of Christ in you. Right, God's Spirit gives you the the characteristics, what we need. His His that He gives us the gifts that we have to be able to have the character to do these things. All right, so I guess yeah, that that goal fits in that. Losing 20 pounds. All right. Again, this, most people probably relate to this. Again, agrees with Scripture. God wants me to be healthy. Uh, number two, uh, do things daily. Eat right, exercise, don't procrastinate. Number three, stop being lazy. That means, you know, get it done. That, you, know, that, you know, exercise and eat right does require effort. And, uh, you know, I, I look at them ants. Them ants are in shape. And for me to handle the ants, I got I got to get in shape, so we can t- so the, so I'm going to win that battle of the ants. All right, number four, do it with all your heart. Anything you do, whatever you choose to do, your heart has to be in it, or you're not going to accomplish it. So yeah, I'm going to do it with all my heart. Number five, we use the strength of Christ in us, right against temptation. There's some temptation sitting back there on that table back there, but you know, I'll, 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 you know, there's some cookies, donuts. That's all right. There's also some fruit. And vegetables back there as well. So, so God, has, God has goals. God, God, who created this universe, he has goals. He has goals for each of us. And the goal is that each of us will be in his kingdom. That we're going to be his children. And that we're going to be productive parts of, of, that, of, the, of that kingdom. So everything God does is according to goals. And he has plans. And see, he wants us to think like he does. And God uses goals to get things accomplished. We need to use goals in our lives, to be successful as Christians. And we can achieve these goals. We can remember these principles. So, set some goals. Set some goals. Don't, you know, set some goals that are lifelong. Trust that God will help you to accomplish those goals.